I very quickly wanted to introduce our two panelists to you for today's session. Carol Ann Tomlinson, who needs no introduction when it comes to differentiation. Carol is an acclaimed author and is also at the University of Virginia's Curry School of Education. Um, for those of us who have been focusing on differentiation in our, in our classrooms, Carol will be no stranger, neither will her uh, strategies and her time-tested advice on differentiation in classrooms. Our second panelist for today is Rochelle Dean Porth. Rochelle is a Spanish and STEAM teacher and is also an ISTE certified educator. She is a very, very thorough technology enthusiast and is going to be talking to us today about how we can use tech tools uh, to go about differentiating in our classrooms and how tech tools can actually support and supplement our differentiated instruction. So that's, that's it from me for today. Uh, I will now very quickly hand over the session uh, to Carol, who I know all of you have been waiting to hear from. So over to you, Carol. morning um, or good evening where you are. It's very early where I am. I'm delighted to have a chance to spend some time with you and I have to say uh, the last two or three days have been those days when all the technology that I have touched has gone to ruin and so I was afraid I was doing something this morning and I actually feel very relieved that it was somebody else's problem for a change so I'm feeling pretty perky right now. The brief time that I have to share with you I'm going to look at the idea of differentiation sort of on two levels, and I think Michelle, um, M Michelle will pick up the um, sequence that I began and look more specifically at those classroom strategies that um, were introduced to you just a couple of minutes ago. So um, I'm going to look with you um, at four big ideas of planning differentiation online and share a couple of strategies with you as well. Uh, um, I don't know why, but my slides are not going. Okay, now they are. Um, so let's start first with just a couple of thoughts about what differentiation is and isn't. Because like most other things in education, people sort of develop their own definitions of things, which makes some sense, but sometimes those definitions go a little bit awry. So, Differentiation really asks us just to accept and to work with a fairly evident fact, and that is that human beings are unique individuals. We're unique in the way we see the world, in the things we enjoy, in the strengths that we bring, and differentiation says that our teaching is best when we acknowledge that and when we teach with the reality that individuals learn individually. Teaching the class does not necessarily teach individuals so well. So it asks us to plan with the student in mind rather than mostly only the students. We hear often the teachers say the students were really engaged today, the students liked this project, the students were restless, and we learn to speak of them, especially because our classes are large as though they were one student. This asks us to really continue to work to put as much emphasis as we can on knowing and responding to each learner. And I think it's fair to say before Rochelle and I shower you with many thoughts, this is a skill that teachers develop slowly over a career by getting to know students, trying to be responsive, looking at what works and for whom, polishing that and starting again. So what we're sharing with you is not we're going to solve all your problems, go forth next week and you'll be fine. Begin working with the fundamentals. Make yourself start something. Take that first step just like you want your students to, but understand that it takes growth over time. One of my students defined differentiation as respectful teaching, and I like that very much. He said he thinks of it as respectful teaching in the same way that he tries to be respectful when he invites a guest to his house by considering the things they would enjoy doing and the food they might enjoy and the conversations they might have. And he said, I feel that I need to give my students that same respect and so I differentiate for them. What differentiation is not 
is only for students who have special learning needs, for students who are advanced, for students who are learning another language. Every child needs a teacher in different ways at different times. So when you plan differentiation, you're not just planning for kids who have acute differences from others, but really trying to value the essence of each student you have and planning for each of them. Differentiation is not about planning a different lesson for each student, which teachers sometimes begin to believe, and that's so overwhelming uh, that it just makes you want to run out of the classroom. We'll show you some reasons why that's the case. Differentiation does not mean giving some kids more work and other kids less work. That's not effective or efficient. And differentiation isn't any particular set of instructional strategies. I like to think of differentiation as a way of being in the classroom, um, a way of being that invites students, that responds to students, that tunes into students, that cares about what they're doing, and who makes that support and interest evident to them. And it is not grouping students by what we perceive to be ability, but rather having them move fluidly among each other depending on the circumstances so that they have a chance to benefit from the particular strengths and perspectives of a lot of different people. So differentiation really, for me, um, involves five elements. All of us have these elements in our classrooms. We may or may not name them, but they're there. The learning environment um, where we need to have strong connections between teacher and student and student and student. And the better that learning environment is, the better all kids will learn. We need to have high quality curriculum that has two big traits. It's planned for engaging students. We really plan it with the goal of having all kids be motivated to continue with us. And we plan it to make sure that they don't just memorize and give back, but that they deeply understand. Need good use of formative assessment because without that we can't plan as effectively and with good formative assessment we also teach students how to learn more effectively. Differentiation involves in instruction which invites us to create work that responds to kids varied entry points into what we're teaching to their interests and to give them some options for how to learn and how to express learning. And then it calls on us to lead a classroom with a balance of predictability and flexibility, both to teachers and students need that. So for me, a really good differentiated classroom um, looks like this. Those five elements, the first four working together with inside that frame of leadership and management need to move together. And if we differentiate well, we have to keep asking ourselves about quality of our learning environment, curriculum assessment, and so forth. It isn't just a set of strategies. It's trying to maximize the effectiveness of every one of the elements that we have in the classroom. So quickly, four um, sets of principles for online differentiation. One is building connections. Um, kids, particularly right now, are anxious, but every year they return to school with a real need to sense the part, being a part of the community, a place where they belong and are cared for, and reassurance, and that certainly matters online now. You need to start every day because of those connections with something wonderful, something that shines a spotlight on the students, affirms them, and plan as much of the day as possible to have kids in chat rooms or Google Meet so that academically and socially they're working together and interacting and not feeling isolated out in cyberspace somewhere. Also making sure that students know how they can get to you and when and where so that they can ask you a question or they can just check in with you because they sort of feel the need to do that. Connecting with kids online is probably even more important than it is in the classroom and it's one of it's probably the most important thing we do anywhere that we Yes. Here's an example from a teacher that I thought was kind of interesting. She gave her kids an online survey asking these questions. I like the 
nature of the question. She's asking kids to tell her about themselves because she wants to know them so she can teach them better. But wisely, she asks them the positive things, the things that they're strong in, the things that they feel good about, because that's always where we need to build from. Once she got these, she began to understand a little bit better the nature of the students she was teaching. But also, almost every day as they did a warm-up online, she would pick one of these and sometimes share a few comments from students, sometimes ask them to share what they had written sometimes tell her story and then lead them to the students. That then built connections among the students and helped them know each other better. It's a really simple, not unusual approach to getting to know kids, but has some rich possibilities, not only to help the teacher, but to help the students connect as well. Second big idea is teaching for meaning and engagement, that curriculum piece. And online, the number one piece of advice is teach less and teach it better. We don't really do too well for kids when we just cover a lot of stuff during the year and feel compelled to squash it all in. We have ample evidence that that's not our best teaching, but it's a hopeless way to teach online. So choose what's critically important. Really focus on that and make sure the kids um, understand it, care about it, and can use what they learn. You might teach around big ideas, and I'm going to show you an organizer in a minute, that helps us and helps the kids make structures of what they're learning, helps them retain it, and most importantly, and therefore makes those other things happen, helps them see how it makes sense. Make sure what you ask students to learn is worth their engagement and their energy and their investment. When we teach things that shows kids that learning is wonderful and the world around them is a wonder, their energy just comes with the package. When we ask them to do rote things for the majority of the time that we're working with them, we lose a lot of that steam to learn that's in young people. And again, make sure as you create lessons that your goal is to help kids understand a few important things in real depth rather than going for coverage. Use some expert groups so that kids who have strengths in a particular area can get together and apply those strengths to the content that you're talking about. So if you are teaching um, a unit that has five parts in it, ask the kids which of the five they'd like to specialize in and then form the expert groups around that in Google Meets or chat rooms so that they can develop their expertise and share with others and will be enlivened by being able to work on things that they really care about and enjoy. This is an example of a teacher who, for the first time in her career, really had an insight about how she might organize what she was teaching. She was teaching earth science, and she was in a workshop I was doing a number of years ago, and she came up to me at lunch. It was a big group, and she said, I just want to apologize if I looked like I wasn't paying attention. And of course, I couldn't even see her in the room, but that was immaterial. She was being human. And she said, I'm so excited. I just figured out what I'm teaching this year. And she said, earth science has always been hard for my students. There's so much in it, and it seems like we keep switching topics. And I just realized that everything I'm teaching is about change. And so I'm going to show them that we're learning under the umbrella of change. And no matter what we study, we're going to be asking um, the same set of questions about it. I want them to see, she said, that we're studying the earth as a whole. And whether we look at oceanography or geology or meteorology or paleontology, it's a study of the earth. And more than that, it's a study of change in the earth. And so we'll always ask, um, how does the earth change in, in the study of oceanography? What do we learn about it through that lens? Why does it change? When does it change? What are the changes? What changes, where do the changes occur and what are the effects of the change? And she looked almost like she was smiling really large, but she also looked almost like she was going to tear up. And she said, I've been teaching this for 15 years and this is the first time I've understood what it really means. It's a simple organizer, but it'll make a difference for her and it will certainly make a difference for the kids. So trying to consolidate and help kids see the purpose of the organization is really huge. 
also um, makes a real difference when we can provide choices for kids and what we ask them to do. Here are two possible assignments you can do. Choose the homework that you think is going to help you move forward. What, how would you like to express what you're learning? How can you demonstrate your proficiency to us in a way that lets you show the most you can? And what about timelines for your work? When is it, when do you need check-ins? What's a, a date within this range that would be workable for you to finish with a good product? And in, online, it's a really wonderful thing to have a segment of time every day where kids can explore something that they really care about. Um, in many places, people talk about a genius hour, which is a time when kids can say, this is something I've always wanted to know, I've always wanted to do, I wanna make a plan for that, and I wanna see what I can really come up with that teaches me new things and helps me um, make a difference in my life or in the world. We can embed skills into that kind of thing that we really need students to have, and if they're working on those self-chosen topics with skills embedded, it frees us up to meet with other students more times and to plan better for fewer things. Once again, make kids partners in your success. Ask them what's working. Ask them how things can go better, what sorts of supports make a difference to them, how the time is working for them, and so on. And then organizing for responsive instruction is a big thing in the classroom and of course even more so when you're not in the room with students. So if you have routines that the kids know will happen online every day and they learn to understand each segment of that routine early on, that makes a big difference. For example, using chat rooms every day so kids can check in with one another, do brainstorming, give feedback, sharing work, um, sharing ideas, asking one another questions, problem solving together. And to have a time every day when that happens or more than one time and to teach them those routines really really enriching and powerful for them make sure that kids know when to turn work in and where and when they'll get feedback and how to use the feedback that they get let them know for sure where you will always post directions make them aware of models of student work that you can put up so that they can kind of get a sense of what they're aiming for and success criteria. The more support of this kind online you can give to kids, the more effectively they can function when you're obviously not right there with them every minute of the day. And this may seem kind of strange um, to tech savvy kids, but I've had contact with a number of teachers this summer um, who said that they were sure their kids were probably better with technology than they, the teachers, were. But when the kids were online, they discovered they really didn't know how to do email, or they didn't know how to create a Word document, um, or there were some apps that just simply were foreign to them that the teachers assumed were um, part of their daily routine. So if they're technological things that you need the kids to know, it's really important to figure out what those are and be sure that you teach them those so they don't get hung up at home on their own. And then the major thing that I want to suggest to you here is in terms of organizing, thinking about your work with two sort of mega components. We often think of teaching and learning as taking kids down a highway from point A to point Q and we have X amount of time to do that, and we're all going to move down that highway from our starting point to the finishing point, which will be the same for all of us, and we will all learn the same stuff. That's a great idea, but it's not reality. So we do better teaching when we say, yep, the highway matters. There are things I'm supposed to teach everybody, and there are things that we need to do together, but there are also things when the kids need to be working on something for themselves. So it was really helpful to me in the early days of my differentiation, and still is, to ask myself, um, when do we need to be together? Because this is something that matters to all of us. Um, checking in at the start of the day, a mini lecture, introducing a new topic, sharing some ideas, debriefing about a lesson. When is it in this week or in this unit that we all need to be on the highway? And then when is it during this week or this unit that we need to have exit ramps? 
can do wonderful small group instruction online and have small group teamwork, individual practice, independent inquiries, moving ahead with your own next step in learning, sharing ideas. And so if your routine online becomes at what times of the day must we all be together to be on the highway? And then how can I think about exit ramps that give me a chance to enable kids to move forward in ways and on timelines that work for them? It sort of solves the question that I'm still asked really often, and that is, well, when do I differentiate? Where does that fit? We don't see the fit because we're so used to being on the highway. When you plan it with the exit ramps, um, it's much more doable and predictable for you and for the kids. So there are lots of strategies that you can use online. Pretty much anything we can do in the classroom, we can transfer online. And certainly I'm not gonna read this to you, but you'll have access, I think, to the handout. To look at these and say, you know, I do have students who would do so much better with the text if I could have recorded text for them. So I'll have print text, but I also make sure to have recorded text Students can use them when they want to or not. I'll have posted hint cards that remind them what a syncane is or remind them how to use this particular technology feature that we talked about three weeks ago that they may have forgotten or how to do this math operation. And I'll post those hint cards on a, an information board online and let the kids know that if they get stuck, that's a pretty good place to go. I might do a trailer, sort of like a movie trailer for a unit that's upcoming or an inquiry that's upcoming. So the kids can kind of see the big picture and can um, have a sense before they begin kind of what the unit's about. That's particularly helpful for students who are new to a subject or new to a language or who have not seen themselves as successful in school giving them that sense of where they're going and where they're coming from is really important. So all of these things and many, many, many others are strategies that you can move right online and can make a great deal of difference to students' competence and confidence as they learn. I want to share, um, well, I want to remind you again, that which I'm sure again you know, but there's so many websites that give you materials for students at different readability levels. You can tell by the color of my hair that I'm an old creature. And throughout my whole 20 years of public school teaching, any time I needed stuff at different levels, I had to run around to different classrooms and beg from friends and look up stuff in the little tiny library in my town. And the notion that you can go online now and find a, the same reading at six or two or five levels of difficulty is just an amazement. And you can use those uh, sites and materials so wonderfully online. And then finally, I want to share with you something that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it's relatively new in our um, world of technological um, tools for teaching. This is a frame for a hyperdoc. It isn't the whole hyperdoc itself because trying to click on all those links and go to all those places in the midst of a, an online webinar is a little bulky. But this, if you're not as familiar with it, um, gives you kind of a sense of what it might look like and how useful it could be online. This is a science teacher whose students need to learn about volcanoes. And she wants to set it up in a way that makes some sense in terms of their thinking and the evolution of their understanding, but also so that they can work with it independently of her, at least for much of the time, and can go into chat rooms or Google Meets and can have small conferences with her, but it's more or less a self-directed tool. So she has three parts. The top line is an introduction, and she poses the question, why does the earth blow up? And in the first box, she has an icon of a Coke bottle that's overflowing. And that question again, um, why does the earth blow up? And then a link that a student can click on. And when that student goes to the link, and, or could be two links, three links, but probably in this case, because it's introductory, just one. Student clicks on the link, and there's something for the student to watch or to read or to listen to. 
The trick with this is for differentiation that different kids will find some different things when they click on the link. So that a student who needs more visual input rather than trying to plow through heavy text will find something that does a nice visual introduction and gets them going and encourages them. After that, she asks the student, what do you think now about why the earth blows up? And the kids ponder what they've read and try to digest that and share it. But you probably don't know everything, so what are some questions that you have right now? Then the major part of the hyperdoc is the middle part, where she's going to take the students through several steps. First, I'd like you to do this and think about these questions, and then do this and think about these questions. And in every case, she's going to try to use multimedia links for kids. There'll be some articles, some videos, many lectures, text, stories, photographs, whatever works well. And frequently, there will be different links for some different kids. It doesn't mean different link, a different set of links for every child in the class. That's not doable and it's not necessary. But you have, might have material at two levels of reading difficulty or three. You might have some diagrams that are much more complex for students who are more proficient with science and excellent readers. And the same diagrams that are done in a more um, rudimentary way for kids who are just beginning. She also will give the kids a template to guide their learning. Look for this, answer these questions, work with these words so that the students have a stepwise way of going. And then when it's time to conclude, she kind of goes back to that original piece with the photograph now of a volcano a little more sophisticated than the Coke bottle. Again, the icon represents the topic in the question. There will be a link. The kids will again click on the link which sort of summarizes or synthesizes or in some cases um, adds a new layer of meaning. Now what do you think about why the earth blows up? And even after all that time, you probably still wonder some things. So what is it you're wondering that you'd like to learn more about? A hyperdoc takes advantage of the capacity to connect kids to different things online and also provides the opportunity for students to be able to work more independently than totally with teacher supervision. So that's a good deal of information in a large hurry. Summary, be there for your kids this year. Make sure that they see that you care. Make sure that they feel that caring. Connect them with one another. Make learning electric and teach them how much they can learn together and on their own, and it'll be a pretty good year. I hope I didn't drown you, but that's some thought to start with. So I will stop my screen sharing now. Karen, thank you so much yes, for that. I think that's an absolute treasure trove of ideas and strategies when it comes to differentiation. And thank you so much also for clarifying what differentiation is and what it isn't. And how oftentimes we tend to get muddled between those two spaces and not do justice to our kids, thinking that we're differentiating when we really aren't. So thank you for clarifying and you know, sifting the mist um, there. And I loved how uh, you were able to talk about uh, that beautiful hyperdoc and how hyperdocs really are such a fantastic tool when it comes to differentiation because Nobody knows that differentiation is actually happening. And yeah. there, there is sort of secret tool for differentiation because kids are able to, everybody gets the same document, everybody uses it and finds different results based on their own needs. And I think that's, that's probably one of the most beautiful aspects of hyperdocs, um, of how democratizing they really are and how they, they tend to um, not alienate anybody if you put them out in different groups or you know, if, you, if you bunk some certain kids together in certain bunches uh, and kids end up feeling, oh, why am I always put with that, with that lot? Um, and then, and especially in online uh, classrooms, uh, it's, so, it's so important to give children that sense of accomplishment, um, which I think HyperDocs achieve beautifully. And I also love what you talked about, um, the, the highways uh, and exits. Uh, and I think that as, as a strategy, when we 
when we sit down as a group of teachers, as a department, or perhaps even when teachers are teaching the same uh, grade groups, um, it's so important to be able to remember uh, and earmark our highways and our exit strategies uh, for our classroom. So thank you so much for some of those amazing insights, uh, Carolyn. I, I don't think you drowned anybody. Uh, I think you <laughs> many of us from drowning. Uh, in our own thoughts around differentiation. So thank you for that. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in, but I thought I could park them uh, till when Rachel, uh, Rochelle finishes her bit, um, uh, because I think Rochelle would want to pick up on some of the tools that you've already started talking about. So Rochelle, if we just uh, go into your, your um, part of the show and then we come back uh, for the questions. Okay, fantastic. I'm hoping that you can see Yes, we can. My Thanks. presentation. Awesome. Wonderful. You never know. So hello, everyone. I am Rochelle Dene Poth. And um, as mentioned, I, I do a lot of different things. I love learning. I love teaching. And I've spent the last couple of years really trying to change a lot of the things that I was doing in my classroom because a couple of years ago, I was having some challenges when it came to student engagement and just really didn't know exactly how to kind of work through that. And so being connected and having a lot of different contacts uh, throughout the United States and globally even where I could reach out and ask questions and get new ideas. And also with my students being able to take some risks with them and try new ideas, it has definitely been an amazing growth period for me. And when I think about trying something different in my classroom, I always consider like my purpose, my goals. And these are just some of the many things, the questions that I ask myself on a regular basis when I'm looking for new ideas or thinking about bringing digital tools into my classroom. And so for me as a Spanish teacher and as a STEAM teacher, actually mostly as the Spanish teacher, I, I realized that not all of my students are going to go on to use their Spanish skills later on in life. And the best that I can do is to prepare them for additional opportunities in the future. And so I think about, I think about how can I give them powerful learning opportunities and provide more personalized experiences for them? And, and years ago, I thought that I was actually doing that, and I kind of was, but I, I could have definitely been doing it better with more intentionality in what I was planning. Uh, a big part of what I want to help students is to build confidence and to be able to communicate, not just in the language that they're learning, but in general, in our physical classroom space, in the online space, wherever they may be. And then instead of me being the one who's, the, who's standing in the front of the classroom and talking at them the whole time, I want them to take more of a lead in the classroom so they can lead their peers and build their confidence in the process. So when I think about things, those are just some of the goals. Also looking at social emotional learning, which is a huge component, especially now as we enter or have entered the beginning of this new school year, there are so many different ways that we can help our students to build these skills, which are the essential skills that they need, not just now, but in the future for whatever they do. And in anything that you read that's predicting job outlook or skills that employers want for the future, focus on a lot that coincide exactly with these social emotional learning skills. And so I think that if I can put strategies in place, if I can use some different digital tools that can help students to achieve all of these goals that I have that I think that, that would benefit them, then that's when it makes a difference and that's when I decide to try something new. Uh, I'm very big on quotes. I actually, my first book that I wrote was about quotes that kind of push my thinking. And I just chose three different ones to share with you this morning as, or this evening, wherever you are, as you're thinking about students and preparing for your classes and differentiation and one, a couple of the things and just listening to Carol talk this morning and just anything that I've read that Carol has written, um, I, I'm honored to be here with her to speak, but just things that resonate with me is understanding the student. And for me, for many years, I didn't have those relationships with students. I was teaching a way that I had been taught. I had my plan set and I wasn't really open to trying new ideas or taking any risks. And it wasn't until I started actually after law school where I saw the difference that it makes when we are mentors to our students, when we take the time to really understand our students. And like Carol said, like understand the student and work with the student and provide opportunities and different options for them. And so I won't take the time to read each of these quotes to you, 
but I, I enjoy each one of them because they're kind of reminders. So if one of these resonates with you as you're planning, as you're preparing, especially in what may be a challenging year, um, I think, I hope that they will just give you some inspiration to kind of push through, find some new ideas to try and see what happens. Uh, I think if I were going to pick a favorite, I don't think I could pick a favorite. I really do mm -hmm. like the one by Nirvana about giving students the tools and just like let them take the lead, which for many educators, that can be uncomfortable, right? Because we've been in the position where we've been in the lead, we're in the front of the classroom. But with some of the strategies that I'll share with you here today, these can work and these tools can work regardless of where learning is taking place. And I think that's important to remember because if your school, maybe your school year has not started and you don't know if you will be in person or hybrid or distance learning and trying to wrap our heads around, well, what do I do? How do I prepare? Finding methods or using tools that will work and be beneficial regardless of where the learning is actually taking place is what I think we can focus on. So one idea that I tried a couple of years ago uh, was HyperDocs and it's already been mentioned here today but this really is something that my students have enjoyed. At first, for some of them, they weren't quite sure exactly what the purpose was. But what I find to be the most important for my students is to tell them the why that we're doing something. Explain what it is, not just hand them a piece of paper or give them a digital tool to use. But I want them to understand this is what the purpose of this is. This is why I think this is going to be beneficial. And then I involve them in the conversation and find out. And so for me, telling you now, like, hyperdocs work really well in my classes, and my students all really like them, you may not necessarily have the same experience because everybody's always different. But the idea is just to try something, involve the students in getting some feedback, and see what happens, and then take the next steps. I mean, we try something, we reflect on it make some changes, it's all still part of the learning. And so for anybody who has not used a HyperDoc, essentially it's a document that has hyperlinks placed into it. There are different phases that students will work through independently. The first time that I used this a few years ago, I was going to be out of my classroom for a few days because I was having surgery. And as a Spanish teacher, we did not have a Spanish speaking substitute. So teaching five different levels of Spanish at the time, I wanted my students to do something that they could work at at their own pace, that I didn't have to give them all of the exact same thing to work through at the same time. So that was the first time I tried HyperDocs. And to just share some resources with you, uh, the three ladies, Lisa, Kelly, and Sarah, wrote the HyperDocs handbook. There is a website that's there, the hyperdocs.co, where you don't have to start from scratch. The nice thing about what I'll share with you is you can find examples and templates all over the place. Everything's out there on the internet. You just need to find something to start with, adjust it to your specific content area or grade level or the resources that you use, and you'll find it does not take that much time at all to get started. So essentially what students do is they work through these hyperdocs at their pace. So there's an engage phase and then they have opportunities to kind of explore. And when I was not in the classroom, I was able to still kind of monitor what the students were doing because they could ask me questions or they were completing some of the different tasks at their pace. Now, when schools were closed this past spring, I used HyperDocs again because it gave students that flexibility to determine when they were going to work on something. They could spend as much time as they wanted at a given point in the day or throughout the week and build through it at their own pace. Also, in the end, deciding to show what they had learned throughout that process. Now, HyperDocs, there are many different ways that you can create them. Typically, they've been done with a Google document, but one other example tool is Buncee, and Buncee is, and I'll talk about it more later too, a multimedia creation tool that you can do so many things with, which is nice when you can find one or two tools that really enable you to do a lot. But this was an example that one of the teachers I know created for her students that basically worked like a hyperdoc. She had three tasks to do. She had an image and each of those linked to some other activity or a website or a quiz or whatever she needed them to do. And they could just work through that at their pace. So the benefits are, 
you know, students can go through at their own pace. You can see their progress as they're completing some of the different activities. It also gives you, at least when I did this with uh, my students in class, it gave me the opportunity to walk around and talk with each student every single day. And that was another benefit is that I truly felt like I was able to teach every single student every single day. I knew where they were in terms of learning. They were comfortable talking to me about how they felt about what they were learning. And so it was a really good idea. Again, something that can work regardless of where learning is actually taking place. So besides HyperDocs, another one is uh, choice boards. And for anybody that has ever done these, then you know there are a lot of possibilities for how you can create these. Honestly, the first one I made, I grabbed a piece of notebook paper, there was no technology involved at all, and I just drew the squares, I wrote in activities in my handwriting, I ran, I made copies for my class, and when they came in, my students were very confused because they didn't know what it was. They said, are we playing tic-tac-toe? I said, no. And so I explained it to them and I explained it to the point of, because they would look at the activities and they would see, well, how come this one just says I have to do a drawing and describe it in Spanish, but this one says I have to create a presentation or do a skit. And they noticed there were different levels of kind of like an easy to a more difficult or in their words, like this will take me five minutes to this might take me an hour. So I explain to them Webb's depth of knowledge so that they would understand the types of activities and why there was a variety. And they said, well, why don't we all just do the same thing? And I said, the idea is you choose where are, what's your comfort level right now? Where do you want to begin? What is something here that meets your interests or that you're curious about trying? And so the first one, like I said, was on paper and the students worked through it. But then after that, I did use like the example on the screen and had links to different websites, ones that we used a lot in class. I did also use this in the spring with my students in my Spanish two, three, and four classes for a lot of different reasons. Uh, one, we were studying about Argentina. And so I had a choice board that gave them a lot of different things to explore and then share with their classmates about Argentina. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be one that has hyperlinks, it can be done on paper and just different ideas. But the whole concept is that you give students the choice of how to practice and engage with the content. And of course, whenever they have that, I've seen the engagement, the motivation goes up, their retention of the material increases. And so it does make a difference. And having those conversations with students as well, my students will say, I really like being able to choose. and what they've created, even with my first one that was on paper, made a difference for other students because if they, let's say, did a word search they created, or maybe they did a crossword, or they did something that was a visual, I could then display that in my classroom and other students could use it to practice the content. Or if they created a game with something like Kahoot or quizzes, then we could share those with the class. So it wasn't like they were just creating it and it was done and we moved on. There are things that we can continue to use in our classroom and I can use with other classes as well. Uh, Genius Hour has already been mentioned today and this is something that I started a couple of years ago, and kind of got away from, but back at the end of this past school year for my STEAM course, which is for students who are eighth grade, uh, we were trying to kind of help them to balance this. It was overwhelming to have all of their classes suddenly online. And so the course that I teach is about emerging technology. And so we do augmented virtual reality, artificial intelligence, but I also teach them basics like what is technology, digital citizenship, how to build your presence online, and kind of build through other topics. So one thing that we did this year was Genius Hour. And students struggled at first because they didn't know what to study. They didn't know what to create. Um, they wanted to be told. And I said, that's not the idea. The idea is you find something that you're interested in or that you're curious about and you decide what you're going to share. What are you going to create and how are you going to share that back with your classmates? And as an example, well, two things. One, John Spencer makes these videos. So the video that's just kind of playing in the background, if you look up John Spencer's YouTube channel, you will find a lot of great videos for things like Genius Hour and Project-Based Learning and some other topics. 
Uh, also a book that I read, Don Wetrick wrote a book called Pure Genius. And for anybody who's just new to Genius Hour, it kind of goes back if you've heard of the Google 80-20, where 20% time is kind of focused on your own exploration. So with Genius Hour, you can decide maybe one day a week is for students to explore something they're interested in, or maybe it's just a part of a class period. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. And another example, somebody created a Bunsy to give students a chance to kind of explore or create an adventure. So it, it's not focused on a specific tool. It's focused more on giving students a chance to find something that they're interested in and basically share their genius and teach others and be excited about what it is that they've learned and curious about the next steps. And so Genius Hour is, again, something that can work regardless of if you're in your physical classroom space or transitioning back and forth. Kind of tying into that a little bit too, also project-based learning. Uh, I was completely wrong about what PBL was years ago. So people had asked me, do you do PBL, project-based learning? And I kept saying, yes, I do. And I thought it was kind of an odd question because I thought I've been doing projects forever, but I was doing projects with my students. I was not doing the authentic project-based learning. And it wasn't until I read the book Launch by A.J. Giuliani and John Spencer that really started to tune me in because there was a quote in that book uh, that said, if you assign a project and get back 30 of the same thing, that's not a project, that's a recipe. And I thought, oh, well, that's okay. So we need to change this. But authentic PBL is something that I wanted to do. I highly recommend going, it's Buck Institute, but the PBL works is where I started. And I looked at the essential elements of project-based learning. I had read the book, Pure Genius. It gave me some ideas tied into Genius Hour, but also more of giving students the independence to drive their own learning. Uh, the book Launch by AJ Giuliani and John Spencer, and also Reinventing Project-Based Learning by Susie Boss. There are so many resources out there. And of course, some videos by John Spencer. But what I did when I started is I explained to my students why PBL was different than projects and what I'd hoped they would learn throughout that. And we set goals together. Uh, it was uncomfortable for them at first, again, because they were so used to being told exactly what to create. And definitely in my class, I would tell them, this was the project, this is the format that I wanted in, and don't do anything that's different than this for years, because that's the way that I had been taught myself. So I figured that's the way I need to keep doing it. But when I saw the engagement going down, and when I realized I wasn't doing the authentic PBL, I really wanted to make some changes. And so some of the tools to do this I'm sharing here on the screen and just some screenshots. As a Spanish teacher, I wanted to really connect my students with other classrooms. And so we used Edmodo to interact with uh, two schools, one in Argentina, one in Spain, and just start conversations. The hardest part for my students was figuring out what they wanted to study. And also, what is it supposed to look like when they're done? And so we just kept having conversations. And again, I was new to it. So I was learning with them and in many cases from them as well. But I didn't want like looking at this now, it's not like we did all of this at the same time. We started with individual steps. So we connected with the classroom on Edmodo, had conversations. My students were able to ask questions to those students and say, what's it like to go to school in Argentina? Um, do you have a problem with stereotypes? What's family life like? And really ask questions that they were able to get meaningful, authentic, genuine answers to, rather than me saying, this is what it's like to live in Argentina, or show a video, or talk about my own experiences. So that was the first step. We then used Flipgrid, which many people are familiar with, to then have conversations and the excitement of my students when they were able to actually see and hear the people they had been talking with online for the prior two months and make that connection, it took it to a whole new level. So they were very excited to talk to them and surprised to see, wait, there's school in Argentina, that it's outdoors and they're wearing uniforms and there are mopeds that students ride to school. So connecting our classrooms like that, again, took their learning to a whole new level. And we continue to add other tools along the way. 
The Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, it's very important for students to, as they're developing social emotional learning skills, their own self-awareness, but also to develop social awareness and understand what's happening in the world and to be able to connect with that and look at their community, but also look on a global scale and develop their own understanding and being able to ask questions of students in Argentina. And at the end of this past school year, with the students in Spain who were experiencing so much with the pandemic and for my students to be able to ask them questions, you know, one on one and have this space really made a huge difference in the amount of learning and um, just the experience of my students as well as the other students. So we did use some different tools of the Flipgrid, the Edmodo, Buncee, my students created an about me and shared that with the other students so they could kind of interact in that space as well. And we used a few other tools that I'll mention here coming up like Nearpod. My students said, hey, why don't you come to Pittsburgh and made a lesson that we sent to the students in Argentina who had never heard of Nearpod. They worked through, did the virtual reality tours, uh, took the polls, everything that was in there, and were so excited about it that they then created a, why don't you come to Argentina Nearpod lesson for my students and myself. And so I thought, this is going beyond just the PBL. This is students teaching each other, building their own relationships and interacting in a space that's safe for them. And it, it just has been an amazing couple of years building this with project-based learning. And again, this is something that can be used regardless of if we're in our classrooms or at a distance. Now the next one, station rotations, is something else that I was not really very good at when I started. And a lot of the questions that I do get now is how do we do this? And there are some suggestions. And the first place that I would say to go for recommendations would be Catlin Tucker's blog site her whole website. She has so much. I read her book, Blended Learning in Action, and she has even more recent blogs about how you can still do station rotations in those social distance classrooms or in the remote setting. And for me, all it took was me getting rid of the rows in my classroom because I felt I was so disconnected from my students. My students in the back of the room, I couldn't reach. If they had questions, they either weren't comfortable asking me or they felt like I was too far away. Or in some cases, I was the one who was talking for the whole class period. When I got rid of the rows and I broke them into just little clusters in my room, I kind of like dove right into doing some of these station rotations. And there were challenges because figuring out what types of activities, the timing, uh, the placement of the activities, the order, you name it. But what I did notice is that it only took a matter of a few days for students to come back and tell me how much more they liked class this year. And I didn't know how I felt about that at first, but knowing that I was hearing back from them and they were telling me like, why? I said, why? And they said, because we can work with our classmates. We have different activities to do. We get to interact with you more. I feel like I'm learning more because I'm doing things that are hands-on. Uh, it's not all the same all the time and we're moving. And I thought, okay, we're on to something. And so I needed to keep working on it to make it kind of better and to adjust the timing. And so there are a lot of great reasons for using this. And Carol had mentioned, you know, like shaking things up a little bit, right? Getting students to interact. Now, in a remote space, this still can work. If you have, if you're using Zoom and you can do a breakout room and students have different tasks to work on together, using a tool like, say, Padlet, where, and I actually use that in my classroom and put the different station activities on the Padlet and had it on display in the front of the room because some of my students were not able to be in class every single day because they were actually taking a full day of classes without even a period for lunch. And with labs and phys ed classes, they couldn't be in Spanish all six days of our rotation. And so this was something that actually worked really well for them because the components that were a game of say Kahoot, or it might've been a lesson with Ed Puzzle, they could do that on their own. Or if it was a worksheet, they could do that on their own. But for me, 
it was another opportunity where I really got to work and feel like I was teaching every single student every single day and make adjustments as I went and have those conversations and brief interactions with students that would really give me an idea of where they were in terms of learning that also helped them to identify where they were in terms of learning as well. And so many ideas out there, it, it could be a mix of an activity with technology, it can be a hands-on. Sometimes I would just give students materials and I would say, okay, I want you to come up with a game or I want you to come up with a way to practice this content. And so again, if we are spreading out in our classrooms, thinking about how can we do this where students can still have activities, it can be done. It won't necessarily be as, I'll say, easy as it typically would to set things up, but we're, we're educators and we're flexible and we're creative and we can make it work and we can also check out what's out there to help us and I would definitely recommend Catlin's blog. So I've been talking about some different tools with those strategies and just want to take the last little bit of time here to share some tools that really enable you to do a lot and that give students choices, that give students an opportunity to kind of work through and connect with the content that will engage students more in learning. And of course, we can always revise if students say, you know, this really isn't helping me and have a conversation with them. So I've already mentioned Buncee. If anybody has used it, uh, if you haven't, I would definitely check it out because there are a lot of things you can do with it. And I'll actually show you uh, on the next slide but Flipgrid, video response, having a space to check in with students, checking in with students and finding out, asking them questions, just to get an understanding of where they are in terms of learning. And then based on the conversation, there are so many options out there that we can use to help them engage with the content, to practice, um, to move at their own pace. All of these options are available. So with Flipgrid, the bottom left screenshot here shows you just some things that you can add and attach to a Flipgrid lesson. So maybe you record a video explaining something and attach a game of Kahoot for students. And then as the teacher, we get to see how the students did on that activity. Or maybe it's a Nearpod lesson that you connect with Flipgrid and you want students to then talk about it and record a video, offering students options where they can either write about it, they can talk about it, however they want to actually show what they've learned or explain what areas they might need to have some more help or um, instruction with. Formative is another tool and that's the one that's here on the top. If anybody has ever used it, go formative. You can, I've used this all through remote learning as well to kind of teach a lesson and have videos in there. I can have students draw and show their work. They can write an essay. There are a lot of different choices as far as content and types of questions, which is good for students to have a mix. Because I know for myself, I can, I'm, I much prefer explaining things than having all multiple choice because I can think through and, and really be clear in what I'm thinking as I process it versus multiple choice. So it's nice to have that mix so that each student has a chance to kind of show what they've learned. Uh, GimKit is a game-based learning tool, which I'll show just some screenshots coming up. But again, it's one that my students like because it uses the content and it kind of repeats through it. So students get to interact with those specific words or whatever it is that the, the focus is multiple times. And that's something that my students told me after we played it for a few times. They said, what I really like is that it, it keeps asking the same question. So you see it more than just the one time. And so I feel like I'm just getting to learn it even faster than other things that we might do. Uh, I've mentioned Nearpod just in terms of activities. So you can have quizzes in there. You can even put a Flipgrid video in. You can have students draw things. They can collaborate. You can have polls. So checking in quickly with students. There's lessons already available in Nearpod. Quizzes, I will mention again coming up, it's a game-based learning tool, but it's great for students to be able to work at their own pace because you can do all of these things either as a live lesson or they can be set for student paced. And even in some cases, students can go back and work through them again. And you can get the, the data and see, maybe they worked on one activity and it took them a longer period of time as opposed to something else. Or as a whole class, see what the answers were and if there are specific areas in either address the entire class 
or use that to work one-on-one -on -one with each student. And that's what I think the power is in using some of these options. Uh, another great tool is also Wakelet, which can be for sharing videos and giving students a chance to collaborate in a space, giving maybe even a class website in the sense that it's not the traditional website, but a space for you to share resources or to record a Flipgrid video of yourself teaching a lesson, to give students a chance to kind of add their own materials to it. It could even be used to share study materials for students. There are so many possibilities. And I did want to come back to Bunch just to show you what it looks like. Uh, students can create any number of things. There are thousands of templates in, available in the Buncee Library, but it can also be used for formative assessments. And you can have free response for students to answer. There are uh, multiple choice that they can do. They can create their own Buncee. And the nice thing about it is that each student can find something that meets their interests and their needs. And for me, as a Spanish teacher, when my students are thinking about the vocabulary that they're working on, searching in the more than 35,000 items in the library and finding the specific word and then placing it in, adding the Spanish and that can, the way that they're connecting with it because they're creating, it becomes more authentic and meaningful for them. And they remember that. And my students that have told me over the last couple of years, I mean, they just love when they get to choose how to show what they're learning. And it's not just me saying, okay, I want it like this. And these tools can also be used for Genius Hour or project-based learning or choice boards or the hybrid docs. So it's nice that they all kind of interact and you can use them for so many reasons. And then finally, game-based learning. There are a lot of options out there. Uh, many of us probably using Kahoot, for example. GimKit is another one quizzes, there's Quizlet Live, and we don't have to use all of them. What I've been saying a lot is less is more. And so even though I'm sharing a lot of different tools with you, the idea is that most of these tools really enable you to do so many different things, um, just picking one or two. So maybe you pick Buncee and a game-based learning tool, or you try Nearpod and one of these. The idea is that it really gives students some choices in how they're learning, how to practice, if they want to go back and practice again. It gives us as educators the, the data to look at and see where all of our students are in learning. So then we can have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and we can follow up with a different type of an activity for them, uh, giving them options and being able to have those conversations with them and I like, you know, the, the real talk and being able to interact with our students makes a big difference. And so these finally are just some of the tools. A couple of them I didn't mention just for time, but you may recognize some of those symbols. And so I would say, just think about your classroom, wherever that classroom space is, and what are some of the activities that, that matter the most to you? Are you noticing, for example, a disconnect where you're not connecting with students and having conversations? Or are you not in your classroom and you're worried about students being able to interact with each other and with you? Are you looking at ways to have students be able to talk about what they're learning more? And maybe some students don't want to record a video, but they'd rather write a blog or maybe they want to create a game. It's just about giving students choices. And so in the end, so many benefits. Uh, my classroom, I mean, hands-on, their social skills, social emotional learning skills continue to improve and build, which are essential. They're collaborating, their creativity. I have students who say, oh, but I'm not creative. And when we find a tool that enables them to really create something and make it their own, uh, it definitely makes a difference. So these are just some of the benefits. And, uh, and I hope that you have some new ideas if you do have any questions for anything, please let me know. Uh, I am, I always say I am not an expert. I'm just somebody who really likes to learn and try new ideas and engage my students with learning some of these new ideas and learning from them and then seeing what we can do better. So please connect with me. Uh, would love to hear from you, hear how you've used some of these or you know, if you try one, how it goes and uh, look forward to some questions if anybody has any.
Michelle, thank you so much. I think um, in, you were able to cover more tools in the last 20 minutes than we've been able to cover in the last six months across our webinars. So <laughs> thank you for that. I think uh, if anybody wants to do a whirlwind tour of the most useful tools out there right now, you should come back and revisit this webinar recording and keep picking up a leaf from uh, Rochelle's slides to try out all of these interesting tools. Uh, and I love, Rochelle, how you were able to connect um, all of these different tools back to what Kara was talking about when it comes to differentiation, when, uh, especially with tools that you were talking about in terms of um, uh, creating interesting assessments and how uh, even when Carol was talking, she was talking about how differentiated assessments uh, and the way in which we're able to actually give students the opportunity to demonstrate their own learning in ways that they are most comfortable with is perhaps the most important aspect of differentiation. And I think a lot of these tools allow us to do exactly that. Some kids feel comfortable drawing, some kids feel comfortable recording videos and sending them across. Some kids feel comfortable just doing mind maps. And all of these wonderful tools out there have now actually been, they've actually enabled um, that, uh, the, the process of differentiation to be carried out in a more, um, uh, in, a, in a smoother manner. We have more options available uh, for us as well. And a couple of questions that came in that I thought I'd, I'd just throw open to both of you. Uh, the first one was on peer feedback. How do you both feel about peer feedback when it comes to differentiation and in what ways can we incorporate uh, peer feedback into our differentiation practices. So very quickly, um, can, I, can I start with Carol? Well, I think peer feedback has great potential and it also has a great pitfall. Researchers who have studied it um, tell us that when students give peer feedback, most of the time, most of it is incorrect. And the problem with that is that we are assuming that they know what feedback means and how you give it. It assumes that they understand what the learning targets are and that they know how to work with those things. And we frequently forget to teach the process. And it sounds wonderful, give each other feedback, but that's a walk through the mud. Um, there's a wonderful little video online that you can find called Austin's Butterfly that I've really enjoyed seeing um, where a, a man is working with a group of young children to help, well, uh, middle elementary students, um, to help them analyze the drawing the student did. And by virtue of what he's doing, you can see the students be, being guided in this process. Well, what is it you're looking for here now? And how would you say that? And do you think he's finished yet? Can you give him some encouragement to keep going? So if we can teach students to do feedback um, so that it's meaningful and targeted and graceful, then kind of like what Rochelle's talking about, it teaches them multiple skill sets that will go with them well beyond that class. But assuming that that's good instinct, not so great because even we as teachers get feedback that's sort of off pass, off um, focus really often and even for us, learning how to give targeted, actionable, meaningful feedback is tough. So once we learn it, we can help the kids learn it and then giving peer feedback makes a big difference. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that, uh, Carol. I think uh, the, the process of feedback uh, is really, really crucial. Uh, and breaking down how good feedback needs to be given is also an art. And it's not something that we should just expect kids to know. Because we as adults often falter at giving feedback. How often are we actually practicing good feedback uh, strategies right. in our own uh, teaching practices? Uh, Rochelle, your take on that. I don't even think I have anything to add to what Carol said, that, but I, I, did, I, I think just the one thing in my own experience with project-based learning, I have my students doing peer feedback, just giving them kind of a starting point and modeling for them how to do it, because we can't just always assume that they, they know how to do that, because I've had some students who are very brutally honest with some of their peers, and I think, oh my goodness, that was awkward, but in, in one point, I mean, what they said the student the other student needed to hear it was just maybe they could have packaged it a little bit better so definitely modeling for them or just giving them a starter like three tips of, of things to start with like i like this this is what i was curious about or something to, to help them along 
Absolutely. So modeling and of course, breaking down the process of giving feedback as well as um, sometimes explaining to students what certain goals are for each, for each of them and getting them to understand how those goals can be achieved via one another uh, is also uh, a good way of going about uh, giving peer feedback and then using that within our differentiated um, teaching and learning strategies. Uh, thank you both for that. Second question very quickly um, on collaboration. How is it that we can use collaborative uh, strategies um, in order to facilitate differentiation in the classroom? I know both of you have talked about this in your presentations, but if there was one key takeaway uh, that you'd like to share with uh, the teachers, one most important aspect of collaboration uh, that you'd like to share. Um, I've been fascinated through my whole career by the fact that we have always known that collaboration um, is cr a critical skill in life. A few people manage to work in a silo and don't have to work with anybody else. And you know, when Michelle sits down to do her book, which is laborious and um, puts her in a room by herself a lot. We all have that. But there are always so many students that just hate the idea of collaboration. They just really despise it. And I think um, that's important for us is to understand what goes wrong when kids collaborate. That's true even when they're just a couple of students, but when you have a room full of students, um, I mean, I'm sorry, a larger group full of students. Frequently what happens is we've asked them to collaborate on something where part of the students have the skills to do it correctly and smoothly, and the other part don't have those skills. So the kids who have the skills want to get it done, and they forge ahead, and they don't even include the others in the group. And then these guys are angry because they were left out. And these guys are angry because these guys got credit for the work that these guys did. Um, and it's, it's really important to create tasks for them that call on multiple talents and to try to create the task where you're pretty sure that everybody in that group has things to create, which means not just always reading base, writing base, math base, but hands on good question asking sense of humor that can get through and, and make you make progress so that you don't have two kids that were set up for success and three that were set up to sit on the sidelines. Um, and so I think the nature of the task, again, the demonstrating, the modeling, the talking with kids about it, being honest, trying to unpack why it is that some kids don't like that kind of work and seeing what we can do in partnership with them to create tasks that call on the strengths of everybody to contribute. Absolutely. Calling on everybody's strengths and being able to also perhaps have roles in place for each student is so important to collaboration. Rochelle, um, you know, being the tech enthusiast that you are, is there any tool that pops up to you which allows for doing precisely something like this? And I know there are no magic wands, but one that yeah. sort of will uh, best in terms of how Carol was describing the way in which collaborative tasks should be set out. Yeah, I mean, Number one, one that pops up a lot because I use it for years is Padlet because it gives students a space that they can kind of work on. But you can do that also with Google, uh, a document or even Wakelet, just having a space where students, because it's hard if they're not collaborating in, in class, they need to be able to learn to collaborate like we are right now in the world and it's not always going to be in that space. So having a space where you can actually see or assign roles because you could have columns, that pops in mind at first. That, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, unfortunately, I wish we had more time to take more questions because there are a few others, uh, but it'd be great if both of you could sort of pop back into uh, the Facebook chat at some point in time and take a look at some of the questions there. Um, I'll do that as well uh, to follow up on some of the questions that have come in. Uh, thank you so much to both of you for what has been such an enlightening session today. I think, um, Carol, with all of your strategies and years of experience and seeing what works in the classroom, uh, and Rochelle picking up on that and tying that in with 
tools that are perhaps the need of the hour because schools have gone remote. Um, I think we've, uh, we've been able to, hope, we're hoping we've been able to give teachers uh, things that they can take right away into their classrooms and start using and start experimenting with. So thank you both for being able to flesh this out so beautifully for all of our participants today. We apologize once again uh, to both of you as well as to the participants for the technical glitch and we're hoping that uh, participants, everything that Carol and Rochelle had to share with you was worth the 15 minute wait uh, for, at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, thank you very much for joining in. Thank you very much for asking such interesting questions and for keeping the conversation alive on the Facebook group as well. Thank you, Carol, once again for your time and your wisdom. Thank you, Rochelle, for joining us and for, um, and for the fantastic tech insights that you brought uh, to the session. And we hope to see all of you back all of the participants back here next week for our next weekly webinar. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. My everyone. pleasure. Have a wonderful week ahead. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.